This is Disrupted. I'm Wayne Edwards, one of the producers on the show. Each week, Disrupted unpacks the big and small disruptions that shape our lives. This hour, we're re-airing one of my favorite episodes of 2023. It was back in April when we discussed how media literacy is evolving across generations. Part of what made this episode impactful for me was hearing from a roundtable of journalism students. They have a unique perspective on the media they consume and how to figure out what information is true and what's not. And so now, here's that episode of Disrupted. This is my last broadcast as the anchor man of the CBS Evening News. For me, it's a moment for which I long have planned, but which nevertheless comes with some sadness. For almost two decades, after all, we've been meeting like this in the evenings, and I'll miss that. And that's the way it is. Friday, March 6, 1981. I'll be away on assignment, and Dan Rather will be sitting in here for the next few years. Good night. That was the great Walter Cronkite delivering his last CBS Evening News telecast. For decades, Cronkite was called the most trusted man in America. He was one of very few journalists delivering the news every night. Fast forward to now, and journalists are viewed through a much different lens. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You st- can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Sir, our press secretary gave alternative facts to that. But the point really is minute. alternative that facts. If I lost every vote, we would have won the state of Pennsylvania. And the fake news refused to call it, right? Welcome to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown Dean. This hour, we're looking at the evolving relationship between people and the media they consume. Later in the show, we'll hear from a round table of college students who talk about their understanding of media literacy. But first, global media literacy educator, Dr. Belina Diabru. She's president of the International Council for Media Literacy and professor at Sacred Heart University. Her most recent book is Media Literacy for Justice, Lessons for Changing the World. Belina, welcome to Disrupted. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the most basic question, which I'm sure you get all the time, whether it's with your students or the consulting that you do internationally. What is media literacy? (laughs) It is the question that is asked the most. So um, it is defined as the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create within media. But I think of it as um, a little bit larger than that. I think of it more as, you know, how do we look at information and reflect on it and move forward so that we can be better consumers of that information. You know, I think we're hearing more about media literacy now than ever before. We're hearing about it in different spaces, different formats, engaging people in different ways. But the concept itself and and the practice and the concern isn't new. We can go all the way back to the 1970s and 80s when the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, was encouraging the teaching of these skills through children's programming, understanding that at such a young age, that kind of socialization and media literacy is important. But that's not where we are today. How has that emphasis evolved over time? And why do you think it's so important now? I think, you know, when I look at the historical view of where media literacy has been, it's always struggled. And in part, it's always struggled because of the different mediums. You know, we always have people who were against kids watching television and then people who were like, let's think about what television is. People who were um, not interested in film and people who really believe that film changed the world. Um, And then we fast forward to social media and how the evolution of that has impacted our lives. And that changed the way people thought about it. Um, you know, they last night I was actually having this conversation with someone because for many years people thought digital citizenship was media literacy. And then 2016 happened and the world of media literacy became about mis and disinformation, uh, which I actually find to be incredibly problematic because there is so much more to media literacy than this one thing. But yet this is the one thing that everybody understands And in fact, put media literacy on the map because everybody understands mis and disinformation or experiencing it, have 
participated in it, either by being the receiver of it or someone who sent it forth, you know, and shared mis- and disinformation. So much of what I think happens may not even be misinformation or disinformation, but could be information that we don't like or information that doesn't fit with our political view or our expectation. And because of all these new forms of media that you mentioned, we can sort of hone in on this echo chamber of, you know, opinion news that confirms what we already think without actually being literate to understand that part of literacy is being exposed to confronting and contending with different viewpoints, even if they aren't the ones that we hold. I think the problem is, is that information is nuanced and that word is not well understood um, by most people just because we don't think of it that way. Exactly like you said, if you are a Fox News viewer, you see one perspective. If you are a CNN viewer, you see another perspective. And even within that framework, our students right now, my college students, don't really listen to either one of those perspectives. They're receiving their media, their information through Snapchat, through their TikTok. And like you said, depending on what you're listening to or looking at, and especially if you're using it via online methods, you have an algorithm that is following you and then perpetuating these echo chambers so that information isn't any more than that bits and pieces that you're getting in that moment. Uh, And we know the stories are bigger. Um, In fact, uh, there was a Washington Post opinion piece that really talked about how even journalists who are in this space are also finding that they've had to step back a little bit because they realize that it's not quite in the way in which we should be receiving news. We should be getting much more context. And the way in which we're getting our information is so quick and fast, it comes and goes and is gone. I'm also thinking about the growing levels of mistrust in media. Yes. So, you know, I'm going to kind of reveal my age a bit, but I grew up watching Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings and Diane Sawyer with my family and believing what they said because they were journalists and thinking yes. they bring this integrity. Now we're in a space where it doesn't matter if you're with an established media outlet or you're a person with an internet connection and a Twitter account, there is this instant mistrust. How did we get there? And is it as problematic as I and others may feel that it is? I do think it's problematic. I think one of the things that you're referencing is that we had these stationary voices in our lives. They were there every night at 6 p.m. Same people, you know, Peter Jennings. We can go back as far as Walter Cronkite because I remember him even when I was a little girl. Um, And when they spoke, they came with authority. Um, You know, there are these wonderful clips of Walter Cronkite, you know, during the Vietnam War, uh, certainly leading into even when J.F. Kennedy died. And I was thinking about this recently, how that moment when John F. Kennedy passed away, we saw this emotion from Walter Cronkite that we did not usually get at night. He was tearful. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. And now when we see the news, we get emotion and opinions and not facts. Um, In fact, when I teach my students, I I ask them, you know, how much news do you think that we actually receive on a given day? And they think that we get 24 hours of news because that's how it's advertised. 24-hour news cycle. We have this. We have that. And we tend to have really more like 23 hours of opinion makers. And we don't have the ability to discern the difference between an opinion maker and a newsmaker. And so that authority figure, the person that you trust, has lessened over time. And most kids, let's be honest, they're not sitting at six o'clock and watching you know, three newscasters from ABC, NBC, and CBS. They tend to actually not know who newscasters are, which is a whole other phenomenon where you know, we, they were a part of our family. We turned them on. In crisis, we turned them on. I certainly remember 9-11. That was the first thing we did. We turned it on. We watched for the Tom Brokaw. We watched for these people. And they don't have that. You know, as someone who works in this space, 
I always hold space and remember that there are people who may never listen to a radio show or podcast for information, but will go to Facebook, see a meme, and take that as a credible source or take that as representative of the entirety of the facts. And it can often be difficult to push against that. But one of the things that comes through in your work, Belina, is that when we talk about media literacy, it's not just about news, that there are other aspects as well where literacy shows up or where the lack of literacy can really have profound consequences. What are some of those other media spaces or aspects that we should be attuned to? We don't listen to each other well. Um, and I think that is our part of the misrepresentation of how people see themselves in the media and how they see information. So misrepresentation is certainly a, a piece of the work that I do. Um, looking at you know justice issues, but not just um, in just the social justice piece, which I know, you know has been obfuscated by a lot of different groups. It's really about looking at how do we want to be represented by all. Uh, the term Ubuntu, I am because you are, um, it's, a deeper understanding of who humanity is. And to be in that space, you have to look at that from all forms of media and from all perspectives. So viewpoints are incredibly important. One of the things that has been concerning to me is that media literacy has sort of fallen into the space of mis and disinformation as if none of the other things have been there and are part of it. Um, you had Monica Guzman on your show, actually, and I think her work is a wonderful contribution to even the way I think of media literacy, because you have to have conversations in difficult spaces with difficult people. Let's be honest, we all, we're not all um, ready to be engaged in the way in which I'm talking about. And I think this is what media literacy offers, is this opportunity to have these deeper conversations, to be reflective, to have an event come up where someone will say, well, I don't really understand how this came to be and then have a historical context. I'm listening to you thinking about our conversation with Monica. And the thing that I think stands out the most with you right now, Belina, is that often when we think of media literacy, when we think about consumption and engagement, we're thinking about as an, as an individual act, an individual skill. But what you're right. saying is that it has to be relational. It has to be in conversation and in relationship to other people and those around us because that inability or unwillingness to listen further separates all of us. And it's not about political party or ideology. It's all about that relation that we have to the information that we come into contact with, how we use it, how we apply it, and the people that yeah. we think we should be there. Why then do you think that media literacy, increasing media literacy, can actually increase civic engagement? And as you say in your, your new book, help us really change the world in a positive way. I guess, uh, you know, I put in there, I think in the last chapter of the book, you know, it's about finding the middle way. And I think we need to find the middle way when it comes to the things that are happening in the world, politically, socially, economically, you name it. Uh, and I think that's where media literacy has the most benefit. I'm saddened, actually, when I read articles where people feel like media literacy is uh, polarizing or it's about partisanship. That's not it at all. I think it's the easy way to look at it because, once again, it falls into this disinformation space and people look at it from their point of view, like you're saying the wrong thing, you're saying the wrong thing. It is about the relationship. It's about coming to that middle space where we can have a dialogue and see that maybe I don't agree with your point of view, but maybe I can see where it is that your point of view might in fact enhance my point of view and we can get to that middle space. I don't think you can talk about media literacy well unless you build relationship and communicate community with the audience in which you want to discuss anything about the media with. I think about like when you go to see a movie with someone, you know, you love a movie, they hate a movie. You don't walk away and say, oh, well, we're never going to go see a movie again together. You think, okay, well, why did you like it? Why didn't you like it? And then see where you could change maybe the next time you pick a movie together, where you can find that like middle ground of things. That's a very simplified version. That's kind of the leveling up. We have to start with some of the, the easy topics 
before we get into the really difficult topics. And when we get to the difficult topics, we've established these points of reference where you know that I'm not disrespecting your thoughts and you're not disrespecting my thoughts. And we can actually engage in a deeper conversation about why it is you believe what you believe and why I see the things that I see, and then maybe find another way. Coming up, more from Dr. Belina Diebru as she talks about what happens when her students keep track of all the media they're exposed to in a week. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. We continue our conversation with Dr. Belina Diebru. She's a global media literacy educator. We're seeing that some states across the country are trying to restrict student learning, but there are also 18 states that already have some policies in place around media education. That's according to a report released by Media Literacy Now back in February. Ask Belina where Connecticut stands and what we should expect in the future for education and media literacy. I think every educator wants to grow thinking. I really do. I think um, the issue really is, is that there's not a really good understanding of what that should look like in terms of media literacy. Um, we, we lack in teacher professional development in this area. But beyond that, I think that one of the reasons why there is a lot of pushback is also because the general public isn't informed in the way in which media literacy should be taught or even, you know, I, I don't even want to say should be because I think it can be taught in many different ways, but how it can lend itself to growing our education model. Um, instead, we tend to see it as, you know, very, as you said, very one-sided, you know, censorship, cancel culture, it, it goes back and forth. And and both are doing the same thing, oddly enough. Um, and I think that's also a part of the discussion that needs to be had, that we need to grow thinking. I'm always talking about how we should have media literacy beginning at uh, when a parent knows they're going to have a child, which some people think is ridiculous. But we have prenatal classes that talk about all sorts of things. And we have children who are coming into the world from the onset in technology. And even from the minute that a woman finds out that she's pregnant, um, the pictures that are taken and posted online, we don't have discussions about privacy and what that means and the extension of all of that. This is something that I think people need to understand. We watch children often I see on planes and trains being put in front of an iPad or a telephone to sort of be their distraction. It's the babysitter. And I think we need to understand that what that does to the brain. We're starting to finally see a lot more come out about how the brain is being um, you know, changed because of these technologies. We need more of that. Um, in terms of what's happening in the state of Connecticut, it's, I think it's still evolving is what I would say. There was an advisory group. Um, I haven't heard too much more about them since they had the advisory group. I know that there's um, a discussion certainly about you know, the need for civic education, but that's coming through social studies. But the one thing I will say about um, what I see about civic education is the incorporation of media literacy. And there's been a lot of effort in that part. But I think of it as it is something that belongs in every subject area. I also think that one of the things that is always concerning to me is that many times when decisions are being made, educators are not sitting at the table, not the ones who are actually going to teach the work. It tends to come very top down, which is very problematic. Um, recently, there was an Aspen, Aspen Institute report. And when I finished reading the report, there were all these recommendations for educators and librarians, and not one educator or librarian was ever in the actual process of building that report. That's concerning. Um, I think that there are also people who are at the you know, political level that want to do well by people, but don't understand what is actually happening in schools on a day to day. I want to add one more voice to that conversation that's necessary. That's the voice of students, the people yes. who are, are actually going through this. And, you know, as part of this episode, we have this roundtable conversation with college students from different schools across the state, different types of schools, different majors, different programs. And the one thing that comes through loud and clear 
is that these amazing young people are saying, we wish we had more education sooner. And yet all of these edicts and recommendations come and that student voice is missing. What is it that you hear from the students that you work with, um, not just in Connecticut, but really globally, the work that you're doing? What are you hearing from young people? My first activity that I do with my college students is for them to spend a week looking at all the media that is infused in their lives and not just their cell phone, because that's the easy one, because they'll get their screen time, but everything. And at the end of a week, they have to write about that experience. So it's bringing your subconscious to your consciousness so that you see what is being thrown at you, whether it's you're uh, you know, going through campus and the screens are flashing things, your phone is tapping you because of the notifications, you're you know, in, a, in the city and you know, the, the buses have ads, even the bathrooms, we always have this funny conversation because even bathrooms in college campuses have ads, you know, and it's everywhere so that they understand that they are always being consumed by the media. And very often the students will say to me, I knew I was on my phone a lot, but I didn't really understand how much. And or I really didn't realize how much I was getting the singular type of information over and over again. Or I didn't know anything that was going on around the world because the only type of information I'm getting is because I'm on social media and I'm not paying attention to anything else. So it's really bringing that part of themselves back to themselves, because that's what I think is sort of happening here is that they're being taken away from being present and being in the moment with each other and having those in the moment experiences in the college classroom, outside the classroom, in at dinner, um, in conversations, they're not having the depth of conversations that I really want them to have. And so that's the work. I think that's where the work is to get them to really first see it, acknowledge it's happening to them, and then having them find the parameters. They're right. We should be doing this a lot sooner. I think we should really delay some of the things that we are offering to students via the cell phone, via iPads. You know, technology has definitely consumed us all. The pandemic has added another layer to that where it became our connection to the world, but it also disconnected us from the world. You know, so it, it was a double-edged sword. Um, and so I think we need to be cognizant of that. I think the, the level of mental health issues that have come up have also been because people feel very alone when they're together. And I think, you know, we really need to reclaim our lives with saying, you know, we want to put some boundaries in and not be consumed by these amazing media vehicles. As we come to the close of our conversations, Belina, which I hope we can continue because there's so much I want to ask you about yeah. that's relevant to all of this. I'm keenly aware that at the time of this conversation, the time of this recording, we as a country have just learned of the indictment of former President Donald Trump. These kinds of stories can have deep emotional connection and response. We can see deep partisan, divisive language. And in the midst of that, it can be really difficult to find the kind of nuance that you mentioned, the context that you mentioned, the inability to really address the core of what's happening because it becomes lost in all of these other things. And as you said, even when we're together, we can feel apart because we lead with that emotion. Thinking okay. about the broader aspects of media literacy that you've talked about, this kind of breaking news that can push people apart as opposed to bringing them together. What are one or two takeaways that you would offer to our audience to not just understand media literacy, but to practice it even in these contentious moments? I think, you know, the first thing I would say is that you need to listen deeply. We are very much bombarded by things. And, and when I say listen deeply, and this is, you know, a kudos to a podcast, to be perfectly honest with you, as a media educator, I've stepped away from watching the television screen and listening to people instead, because it requires a deeper skill. It requires you to actually patiently wait for the next word to come out of the person's mouth. It has a bigger impact as far as I'm concerned. And so I would say, listen better, listen to multiple sources and listen to people outside of the US. Because one of the things that I find problematic is that 
you know, we tend to forget that the rest of the world exists when everything in the U.S. is happening and it's all happening here. But the world also looks at us and they represent us differently. They see us differently. They talk about us differently. So I'm always a proponent when I talk to my students to say, listen, listen to BBC America, listen to another news station or another podcast from another country to see what it is that they perceive of us or perceive us to be. Sometimes that information gives us another glimpse of how the world sees us, which isn't always correct either. Let's be honest. Um, But it also gives us a glimpse of the way in which we should also be seeing what's happening in front of us. So listening, uh, looking at multiple sources, uh, and then wait, process, and then consider talking about it so that you at least have some knowledge to be coming from to say, listen, I've heard it from both sides of you know, whether it was this station or that station, it seems like something's missing here. There should be more to this story, or maybe it's not enough of a story, whatever it is. Um, And also realize that while this story, I think is a big thing for uh, people who are interested in politics, a lot of our students aren't interested in politics. The story that really captivated them was what happened in Nashville. And I think we have to remember that generationally, we're all in different spaces. So different things impact us differently they're not as interested in politics in the same way as the rest of us are. Some are, but high school, middle school, they're not quite there. Um, college students, they get there, not always, you know, they, they're not as interested. The stuff that is more personal to them are the things that are in their social sphere. And so that actually makes an impact. Dr. Belina Diebru is a global media literacy educator and professor at Sacred Heart University. Her most recent book is Media Literacy for Justice, Lessons for Changing the World. Belina, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, a younger generation's perspective on media literacy. This is Disrupted. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're looking at media literacy in the U.S. Now we turn to a panel of journalism students from across the state of Connecticut. Leading the conversation are our two Connecticut Public Spring Production interns. Melody Rivera is a graduate of Central Connecticut State University, and Elizabeth Van Arnhem is a junior attending Smith College in Massachusetts. They were joined by Tyler Wells, senior journalism major at the University of New Haven and editor-in-chief of the Charger Bulletin. It's the campus newspaper. Faith Arcuri is a junior at the University of New Haven, also majoring in journalism and writing for the Charger Bulletin. Julie Dunn is a junior at Sacred Heart University, majoring in media arts with a concentration in TV, film, and media. And Colin Mora is a sophomore at Sacred Heart, also majoring in media arts, and he's photo editor of the campus newspaper, The Spectrum. Here's how Lizzie started the roundtable. So Tyler, let's start with you. What is your definition of media literacy? Yeah, so to me, media literacy involves basically how we uh, consume, interact, and use um, media as a whole. Uh, As individuals, you know, we're constantly in a state of of using media, um, and there are a lot of ways that that we can use that to um, distribute messages, distribute information, um, and at the same time, you know, take in a ton of information from other, other sources. So, to me, media literacy is sort of our ability to do that and our understanding of how um, all of media works uh, in that way and how we can uh, be citizens in that and, and how we can use it to our best advantage. Colin, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, the media environment that we all live in today is vast. I mean, we consume media almost 24-7. Every second of every minute of every hour that we're awake, we're basically consuming media And so I think that media literacy is just the process of analyzing and evaluating that information that you're taking in. So let's dive into news for a moment. I like going to podcasts in order to find out what happens in the news. So what are your go-to platforms to get the news of the day? Julie, let's start with you. 
So this is a very interesting question. Um, as a college student, I think I can speak for many as far as where we get news from. And right now, especially, I think it is mainly social media. Um, a lot of people use TikTok. I personally use it um, as a main starting point for a lot of the information that I find. Um, not that it's the be all end all for me. I use it as kind of a Kickstarter to dive in deeper to topics with more reliable sources, but definitely Personally, TikTok for me provides those firsthand accounts for a lot of situations, um, more so than a general news cable channel that we would get. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of students in college don't opt for cable. They go for the streaming services. So they're missing out on those big news channels that provide big, maybe bias, maybe unbiased um, opinions on topics. So with the social media that we have access to, we're able to get an opinion from somebody who's accounting for an instance in that moment. Faith, what are your platforms? I'm actually kind of the opposite. I consider myself an old person in a 20 year old body. I'm a commuter, so I live at home. So I actually do still have cable. I watch uh, the local news. I watch the daily news at 630 with uh, David Muir. And I also just read a lot of CNN, New York Times, uh, more traditional stuff. I feel like I get a lot more of an unbiased opinion that way. And it's just easier for me to access because I also just trust what I'm reading more. I'm not a big social media person. So that's my go to. Colin, I've been told you listen to NPR. What specific shows? I do. Uh, I try to listen to Up First every morning just because it's very quick podcast. 10 minutes gives you the top three, top four stories of the day. And it just gives me, I feel a greater understanding of what's going on in the world. And then I also really like All Things Considered. I probably don't listen to that as much as I do Up First, but I do definitely get my news from there. And then I also read the New York Times. But I would also agree with Julie and say that I get a fair amount of my news from Instagram as well, just like, and social media in general, just scrolling down Instagram and I see a post from NBC or ABC, and then I would do further research and look up whatever the post was about. Tyler, do you also use social media to find some news? Yeah, social media is probably um, what I go to the most in terms of breaking news and stuff happening uh, right away. Um, being personally, uh, being someone that's so busy, uh, it's hard to like sit down and necessarily comb through um, too many news platforms. So something like Twitter, uh, especially for me, lets me kind of um, get quick breaking news. And then from there, I'll try to branch out um, and, you know, resources from like the New York Times or Washington Post, so on and so forth, um, to get more of more information into, into something that I might have just brushed over on Twitter, because, of course, you can never, you know, fully trust or, or know 100% of what you see on social media. Um, so I, I personally like to use social media just to get that breaking news and like a jumping off point and then do further research at uh, some more like established news platforms from there. Julie, what do you think makes something a good source of news? A good source of news can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, personally, I think it's something that um, has been kind of evaluated um, we talk about how TikTok is not really evaluated by a person posting something. It's it's their personal opinion. So if in order to get good news from that source, it to me, it means going through multiple people's videos and kind of figuring out what it means, but also fact checking what they're saying with more of an established published New York Times, Washington Post, something where there's some meat and bones to it um, and a name behind it. There is so much information coming at us in the news and on social media. Colin, have you ever been misled about information you received from the media? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I have been before. Um, scrolling through social media, especially, a lot of times I think this happens to everybody, uh, not just in our generation, but every everyone in general. Um, you see a social media post, and you see the tagline and like big block letters and like maybe an image and you think, oh, well, that's the whole story right there. And then you do additional research and look up whatever the story was about and you see, oh, that tagline was completely misleading from what 
the actual story was about. Like the story had nothing to do with with the tagline. So like I'm thinking if I only read the tagline and didn't go do additional research, I would be thinking a completely different thing right now and maybe have a completely different opinion on a topic just because of a post I saw. We hear the term fake news a lot. What are some media literacy techniques that people can apply in order to determine if the information they receive is fake or factual? Well, I had my first experience with like fake news in my sophomore year of high school. It was my first journalism class I'd ever taken. And my teacher had always said to read at least four or five different articles on the same thing. And if you're getting the same information over and over again, it's most likely accurate. I also just look at depending on like where you're getting the news from, because there are certain websites that lean, say, more towards the left or towards the right, and they have a certain lens when they're writing about something. So I always think it's important to research whatever source you're getting your information from. I think a lot of it just comes to trying to get a a well-rounded balance of um, of of your media, um, trying to find, you know, different sources for your information to, to you know, confirm or, or deny what you might be reading. Uh, I think that's kind of the best way to approach it. Um, and then also just kind of understanding, you know, what your role as a, uh, as a reader is, as um, someone who's taking in that information uh, and how it is in part your job to, to really double check kind of what you're reading uh, and get more, you know, of a deeper scoop on it rather than just, you know, necessarily taking everything you read as surface uh, at the surface level as to be an ultimate truth. Uh, and it requires a little bit more effort on the consumer end uh, to kind of reach that conclusion, I think. I think it's also important to check on what the agenda of the writer and the source is coming from, um, because with that comes more of information about where the bias could be. Um, or what their intention with reporting is, whether it's just to report what's happening and give the consumer information about it, or are they trying to pull the consumer one way or the other with a separate goal in mind? So jumping into generational comparison, Colin, what do you see as the biggest disconnect between older generations and your younger generation when it comes to consuming and understanding media? I think as a younger generation, something that's helped us is that we've been raised in this media environment. All of us were raised with the internet around, with TV around, with cell phones around. The generations younger than us are going to be raised with AI around and social media apps around. And so I think that just that exposure to the media from a very early age helps people in our generation almost decipher media messages better whereas older generations are probably way ahead of where we should be when it comes to um, examining print media. Julie, I was wondering if there's ever been a scenario where you've had to intervene with someone that was misled by false information? Um, A specific situation um, doesn't exactly come to mind, but I know we all have had instances where someone maybe reports a topic or an issue that they saw online or on social media and brings it up to you. And we have to kind of decipher that and go through it and maybe also explain to them and maybe it be an older generation uh, member that the topic that they're explaining needs to be fact-checked with multiple sources in order to be completely reliable. Um, And I think older generations, like Colin was saying, they have a harder time doing that because they're so used to their ways um, and they're used to the newspaper coming every day and that being gold versus what we have now is lots of different sources and lots of different media platforms to engage with and get our sources and information from. So I think we have a bit of an easier time intervening with um, others because we know how to communicate that. Well, bouncing off of what Julie said, I think one of the main things is just access. I have two sets of grandparents who aren't tech savvy at all. They have a smart TV that they don't know how to use and they have smartphones that they don't really understand how to use either. And so I think it's just one looking at other sources that they don't understand that there are fake news and other biased sources like that. And they are just kind of just stuck in their ways. I have a grandma who unfortunately still says the N word all the time. And it's just like, they don't understand 
when things aren't politically correct anymore or they just don't understand this i don't want to say like the steps that they need to take to get there but they aren't being pushed to do that so they don't feel like they need to Obviously, you know, it's tough to put a lot of the burden on our generation to teach in that way, but it starts at a small level, um, being able to to educate, you know, family members. Um, and, and I know this from personal experience of being able to work with my parents on on teaching them social media and stuff and, and allowing them to learn those platforms um, that, you know, it makes it easier for them to access, not only access those, but also, you know, understand what they're seeing. Um, and that's a big part of it. As long as they're able to understand, you know, what the inf- type of information that's being given to them is, um, then they can, you know, start making more proper decisions on how they're going to interpret or digest that information. And so I think our generation, um, because of our experience, um, our continu- like constant experience with social media platforms, uh, we have the opportunity to teach in that way to help, you know, start that start forming that media literacy in uh in generations that might not necessarily be have or have been as exposed to them according to a media literacy policy report published last year by a nonprofit group media literacy now Connecticut is now requiring the department of education to develop curriculum for grade K through 8 does anyone have any thoughts on how helpful you think learning media literacy would be for children i personally think that it's essential now because of how wrapped up in media all kids are going to be from here on out who knows where it's going to go um i think that we're i'm in a class with colin right now it's called media literacy and we are learning so much about how to decipher fake news real news um all of the in-betweens and be smart about the media that we're consuming and i think that the news right now with tiktok i think all kids should be aware of the apps that they're using from the start, from 13 and up or whatever the young age now that they could be on it is, um, just so that they're aware of what's going on, what they're consuming, what information is being put out that they provide, and all of the in-betweens. I'm also a huge uh, proponent of teaching media literacy. I think media literacy is a super vital skill that should definitely be taught in schools just because It teaches you how to decipher good information from bad information. And it also just teaches you about understanding the benefits and drawbacks of certain media platforms, such as TikTok or Instagram, understanding the the pros of those platforms and also how they can negatively impact you. Personally, you know, someone that got into social media, specifically Twitter at a young age, starting uh, media literacy, you know, teaching it um, at as young of an age as possible is really the best. Um, definitely before, you know, kids are entering high school and stuff um, in these, you know, formative periods where, you know, they're starting to use uh, social media and starting to kind of understand the world more um, that giving them that, that foundation of knowledge to uh, understand, you know, the media that they're going to be, that either they currently are consuming or they're going to be consuming Um is really important in terms of, of establishing, you know, that understanding so that they can, you know, ease their way into those years as they start using media uh, more and more. So let's talk about how you're applying media literacy to the work that you do. Starting with Julie, tell us about the content you create on TikTok. Sure. So I'm very um, active on TikTok. I make my personal own TikToks, um, combining trends that are going around with sounds and combine them into my own life. Um, It's taught me a lot on how to use the algorithm to my advantage. Um, With that, I've tried to combine it with my professional career goals. Um, Recently, I've been working with Olipop, the soda brand. Um, through their marketing brand, Kale. Um, And with them, I've learned to make TikToks that match a challenge that they give out and combine it with a trend and a sound and do so in a way that will enhance engagement. And I've made a profit from that, which is very exciting. But um, it's taught me a lot about how to do things in order to increase engagement, increase views, um, for a company, which is hopefully a goal of mine in the future that will come to pass. Colin, as a photo editor of your campus newspaper, The Spectrum, 
How has learning about media literacy impacted the way you cover stories from a visual standpoint? Aside from just analyzing and evaluating the media, I also think a big part of media literacy is understanding the technologies that are used to create the media. And so actually props to Julie on this because Julie was the photo editor before I was. And so everything I know is basically from her. No, oh, that's sweet. <laughs> and, and, um, so I think that just understanding how to use media platforms such as like Adobe Suite, whether it be InDesign, Photoshop, Premiere, as well as uh, knowing how to use cameras or broadcast media equipment, as well as just writing, because that's a huge part of the media. Um, I believe that's a, also a big part of media literacy that I feel should be taught in classes as well. We love to hear about that teamwork. <laughs> Faith, as a writer of political and feature articles for your campus newspaper, The Charger Bulletin, how has understanding media literacy shaped the way you cover a story? I think it all just goes back to understanding where you get your sources from. Um, me, I tend to go down a rabbit hole once I start reading political articles. I never thought I would because I used to hate politics, but now I'm obsessed. Multiple sources, that's my go-to. Understanding what I'm reading, boom, we're all good. Tyler, as editor-in-chief of the Charger Bulletin, how have you applied media literacy to the articles that you write and have chosen for publication? When I you know took over in the role, a big thing that I kind of wanted to establish, you know, was was being able to to provide students, faculty, um, basically everyone that consumes, you know, our our news organization on campus, um, and, and understanding that, you know, the stories that we're covering um, and the way that we cover it are meant to be, you know, a traditional style of journalism. Um, you know, we're providing, you know, non-biased news. Um, we're providing, you know, true facts to the best of our ability. Obviously, we're all students, so it's not always perfect, but as much as we can. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big part, you know, of of trying to balance, uh, you know, the various articles that we get in a given week, um, the various stories that we have to cover. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in the media, um, you know, obviously with the rise of social media and everything, you know, a lot of people don't know who to trust or who to believe. Um, and, and I've experienced that in my own, you know, role within the Charger Bulletin um, and how much it's even changed within the last four years uh, that I've been on campus. Um, so, you know, a big part of, of what I've been striving to do is reestablish, you know, that trust and that, you know, understanding that journalists cover stories um, and try to get as much information about a story. And in theory, you know, in doing so, come kind of become professionals um, in what they're covering. And as such, you know, we want to make sure that our readers understand that this is a source that you can rely on. Um, you know, whether that be for a newspaper or for our, our television broadcast side, um, or even stuff like our magazine that we have, you know, always establishing, you know, that sense of this is something that you can turn to if you need information on a story. That was Tyler Wells, a senior journalism major at the University of New Haven and editor-in-chief of the Charger Bulletin campus newspaper. He was joined by Faith R. Curie, a junior at the University of New Haven, also majoring in journalism and writing for the Charger Bulletin. Julie Dunn is a junior at Sacred Heart University, majoring in media arts with a concentration in TV, film, and media. And Kyla Mora is a sophomore at Sacred Heart, also majoring in media arts and photo editor of the campus newspaper, The Spectrum. As an educator, it is always refreshing and encouraging to hear from our younger voices. Many thanks to our disrupted interns, Melody Rivera and Elizabeth Van Arnhem for producing and hosting the roundtable. Melody is a graduate of Central Connecticut State University, and Elizabeth is a junior at Smith College in Massachusetts. This episode of Disrupted was produced by Wayne Edwards, Kevin Chang Barnum, Meg Dalton, and Katie Tularski. You can listen to all the previous episodes of Disrupted by finding us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Disrupted and Connecticut Public. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening. <laughs>